Good day, everyone. I'm here with two of my friends, Dale Boost, longtime friend, and Laurie Dennett, newer friend, although I actually met Laurie before I met Dale in 2005 in Toronto at the uh, joint gathering of the Canadian Company Pilgrims, the American Pilgrims on the Camino. And Dale has some questions from Laurie, and I'm just going to try and get myself out of the way if I can. So have a, have, have a, have a great chat, you two. <laughs> Thanks very okay. much. Thanks, Tom. Laurie, it's so nice that you spend some time with us today. I appreciate it very much. You're here in Canada for a little bit yet, and before you return back to Spain. Um, I, uh, I'm looking forward to this very much. The, you were here in London about three years ago for a book presentation and signing that went exceptionally well. Everybody was quite thrilled with that, and I appreciate that very much. But my first contact with your name was in 2003 when I'm going on my first pilgrimage and I'm getting all this. I'm depending on the confraternity of St. James for information. And here's the chairperson of the confraternity, Laurie Dennett, Canadian. You go, wow, that's <laughs> that's really something. I never expected that. I didn't, you know. I didn't get to meet you then, but I was quite thrilled that, well, here's a Canadian doing all this work with the confraternity and had worked their way up into that position of chairperson. That's really something. That's it says a lot about you way back then, Laurie. And your your literature today is is so important to us pilgrims that you're you're doing a wonderful job documenting what is so important to the pilgrimage to Camino de Santiago. The chapter that um, I had looked at that I would talk to you about, uh, as well as some other questions, was chapter seven, which was the European pilgrims. And this was a presentation that you did at um, Galleria Sergadelos. Yes. In yes. Compostela. Yes. De Compostela. Yeah. And I was so interested in that because as we pilgrims go on, I don't think I, I, I'm alone on this. When we go on a pilgrimage, we meet uh, Germans and French people and Bulgarians and Italians. And I'm not only looking at their backpacks or what kind of clothes they wear that's different from North America, but I'm asking them, what do you do? Where do you get your information? Do you have an association? Do you have a group back mm -hmm. where you are? that gives you information that allowed you to come here with some confidence. And they always seem to say there is that, that facility available, but you're so good that you put it all together in this, in this chapter. And I think it's so important because as time goes on, people lose this stuff, lose this information, this history. And for fear of some politician or organization trying to take over and say oh no no we did all of that we did all we got this all together we brought it all together it's so nice to have this in front of us in black and white confirming that there were individual groups and this is what they did mm -hmm. so if you would please uh give us this review of this chapter we would really appreciate it well um we think along the same lines you and i because uh, the whole motivation for putting uh, Waybread together was to put together, uh, bring together some of that history that I've lived and, uh, you know, heard a little secondhand from pioneers of the Camino, whom I had the great privilege of meeting and getting to know um, about the the whole uh, creation and and growth evolution of the of the network of associations all over Europe and the, you know, the way that came into being, um, it, it didn't didn't owe anything to politics. Of course, now we're in a situation where uh, politicians like to hijack everything. And uh, <laughs> the whole premise behind Waybread is that we don't allow that to happen. We can say, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And you're doing a great job and thanks for your help and, 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 but we must not let them rewrite history. And uh, we mustn't let it be swept under the carpet or be persuaded by what they can give uh, to simply forget about it because it's convenient for them. 
it's not convenient for us. So that's the whole point of Waybread. And that mm. really has been on my mind for a very long time. And, and that talk at the Galleria Sargadelos, um, do you know what Sargadelos is? It's a, it's a, Sargadelos is a, a porcelain works in Galicia. And uh, there was a, a Duke of Sargadelos who founded it in the 18th century. And it, it's a very, very famous line of, of porcelain. Everybody in Galicia has at least one piece of it. And they have like the banks and various other entities, public audience uh, rooms where events can be held. It's part of their uh, communitarian and advertising outreach. And the what interested me about that particular occasion to be invited to give it there was that I knew that most of the people would be simple citizens of Santiago. You know, mm -hmm. they weren't going to be for once the pilgrim community. It was going mm -hmm. to be people who saw the poster plastered all over town and who would simply go there the way they would go to a concert or a poetry reading um, or some other thing that might take place there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and the person uh, who invited me to give that talk was someone I've known for a very long time, a lovely man called Mario Clavel. And he does a lot of writing um, on the Camino and is uh, very active in the, in the Gallega Association. And he simply rang up and said, would you do this? So it didn't come via the confraternity, but I always consider myself representative of the confraternity. And at that point, I think I still was, um, you know, so a properly chair. I still am, I'm a, an honorary vice chair now. So, mm. so somebody rudely said, which vice? But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I'm, I'm an, an honorary vice, vice chair. And, uh, you know, I always mention the CSJ because I feel I owe it so much and I think so highly of it. So, uh, but, but in the content, you'd like me to speak about the content of the chapter? Yes. Uh, you about like. European, European, European pilgrims, pilgrims today is what it was called. And, and it was really focusing on the associations and their role in a sense as hinges between um, the Camino and broader society. And, you know, filtering pilgrims onto the Camino with one uh, hand and then kind of welcoming them back with the other and helping with integration and so on. And, you know, this whole idea of, of living out one's Camino in your home surroundings, providing means for people to do that. So, it, you know, I think of the associations as a, a very precious hinge on the door uh, that, that, that is the Camino. And uh, certainly most pilgrims would not be uh, particularly well formed by the time they get to the Camino were it not for the associations. So they are invaluable. They began usually started by individuals and in the first instance, individuals who met uh, Don Elias Valinha back mm. in the 70s and the 80s and uh, were really inspired to take their sudden enthusiasm for the Camino home and live it by gathering like-minded people around them. And it just works outwards like from there. It's like tossing a stone into a, into a pond, <laughs> you know, and the, all the ripples reach outwards. Mm. So, um, so, you know, for instance, um, Paolo Cauchi, who is now a very eminent figure, uh, no longer the chair of the committee of experts because he stepped down after 20 odd years of doing that. But, um, you know, so he's still very much the chair of the Italian association and the study center that he established back in 1982. And uh, Robert Plutz is no longer with us, but there are now three German associations that have spun off from the original one that he started, having spent a year in Oviedo as a, on a sabbatical. So, you know, and, and uh, it, it, it worked like that. And Mary, Mary Jane Dunn in the States and Linda Davidson um, you know, uh, Pat Quaif in the UK, uh, and, and actually the confraternity came about slightly differently because we had six members of the Société des Amis in Paris, uh, and the secretary of that, Mademoiselle Varcolier, 
suggested to the person who spoke the best French, and that was Pat Quaife, um, who was the second chair of the CSJ. But back then in 82, she'd just cycled it. And Mademoiselle said, well, look, there are six of you on your side of the channel. Why don't you get together and form a confraternity? And so Pat did exactly that, got in touch with the other five, and they had a birthday gathering at Mary Remnant's house um, on Mary's birthday, uh, 13th of January, 1983. And uh, the confraternity was born around her sitting room table. So there we are. <laughs> Sorry, you've gone silent. You are silent, Dale. Sorry, I was <laughs> I missed the wrong one. That's amazing. The uh, the grassroots of of how this all started in Canada here. It was Father Ben that uh, got things moving slowly. Yes, but Ben but, Lockridge. Um, yes, I know. I knew him. Yes. Oh yeah, good, good. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I knew also. It, it doesn't surprise me at all that there's such an active group of people out on the west coast because even before Ben Lockridge there was a man called Dennis Cooney um, from BC who came through the CSJ office um, fairly often and he got about 40 people involved there before there were really was really a, a Canadian company of pilgrims or little company as it used to be called yes so yes it was the little the little, the little company of pilgrims. Little yes. company of pilgrims. We even had our own little badge still. The little yes of pilgrims. <laughs> yes. Well, I remember the the first secretary of that, Mike from Toronto here, um, oh, yes. told me that its name, and I said, "Well, you should watch that. Put put parentheses around that because you won't be little for very long. Yeah, right. <laughs> it'll it'll grow, and you're now three thousand some odd strong, mm -hmm. right across the country." Just pretty wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it speaks to the groups how they how they've grown. And in two thousand three, uh, Nancy Me was the secretary, and I was asking her for information. But she was always referring me to the Confraternity of Saint James in England, where you yes. were the chairperson. And they were so wonderful. They, you know, I got my guidebooks. Uh, I got my two thousand three Camino de Santiago. Guide, yes. And, yes. You know, I got my bulletins, and they were so helpful to give me that information. When in my first Camino in two thousand three, I had I had the Bible because the Germans, the French, the you know the other people didn't have the kind of detail, yeah, and studied information that the English group had. The Confraternity of Saint James. So there. Well, you do you know why that was the case? because we always, um, we've always urged a very, very active participation in things. And that doesn't necessarily mean coming into the office to do things, it's whatever you can do. And we said to everybody going down the Camino, please keep notes and let us know of any changes, any new places, change telephone numbers, tamperings with the arrows, you name it. We yes. want to know about that. And a new edition of the guide to the Camino Frances came out every single year. Yes. And people would always say it's the gold standard. And mm -hmm. in an albergue, you'd get people gathering around, peering over your shoulder so they could replicate the, the you know, what the what the uh, gold standard book said. So yes. it, it really is a, a, a star publication, but everybody <laughs> has had a hand in it. It's not the work of one person. Of course, dear Marion was the person who coordinated all of that. Oh, one yes. Million things that she used to do. And yes. Pat, too, did a great deal with that. So, Marion was so good to me. I, my daughter, one of my daughter, our daughters lived north of um, London in Hartford. And I'd come down to the confraternity office when I was over in England. Oh, I was in there 15 times, but I, if there was a Canadian pilgrim book, I'd take it with me to put in the library there. And she thought that was so good. I even took her one of my, our Camino t-shirts. Oh, wonderful. Oh, yes. With her yes, London, <laughs> London pilgrim t-shirt on. 
wonderful. <laughs> oh, she's a lovely lady. She uh, she, passed she was in 2019, I think. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it, there was so much information there, and it always was so good that um, you're right. It was the gold standard because people that on the Camino that I had met on other Caminos that I had been on would say, "Well, how do I get a hold of the confraternity, or what can I?" You give me the email because if they've got that information, and uh, you know, I'd like to get some of it as well. So it <laughs> it was it, and it still is one of the very yes. best. Yes. 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 I, have the well, big we, Camino, I have the big Camino map here of England with all yes. the Camino sites. Now, very few people know that there's a lot of Camino activity in England way back when. So, oh, yes. That, be... that map, that map uh, I think, is the most astonishing production. Mm -hmm. It yeah. was made by one man, uh, and he... Now, I, I think it, his name may come to me, but uh, that was a product of something called the Research Working Party that we had for some years centered on the University of Birmingham when um, uh, we had a couple of academics, one after the other, active in that university. And a couple of us would go every year up to Birmingham and put together all the information we could find on individual counties. And we tried to identify somebody in each county of England who would take on the job of identifying all wow. the monuments, dedications, uh, hmm. you know, anything you can think of that was to do with the pilgrimage. And we planned to publish a series of those. Now that that project kind of went into abeyance. Um, first the academics passed away and then some of the county coordinators passed away. That map uh, was a map intended to show the devotion to St. James before the Reformation. And there are something like 400 and some odd dedications of churches and chapels to yeah. St. James the Great in just in England, England and Wales. Um, yeah. I don't know uh, about Scotland, but um, that map is a very valuable piece of history and he put an immense amount of work in to it. I think we still have some in the office, but we're trying to get the county coordinators um, uh, research function back on the rails and start publishing those county guides again, which means that if you go to, you know, uh, Westmoreland or somewhere like that, one of those places that uh, on the you know current parlance doesn't exist, but you can explore it historically because somebody's mm -hmm. taken it on and done the research. Um, yeah. you, can, you can put together a history of the pilgrimage in that very restricted area, multiplied by all the counties, and there you have it. So it's very interesting. It is, Routes it's to the true. coast and uh, you know photographs and all manner of things. So stained glass. It is amazing. I've been in a few churches over there that were yeah. because of this map. When I go, when I went over there to see our daughter, I'd go into those churches, and yes, there's the evidence of devotion to St. James. And yes, otherwise... well, Cromwell and his and his uh, not so merry men um, put a stop to that because anything that fomented pilgrimage was anathema. Uh, once the uh, church had broken in, broken with Rome, um, mm -hmm. pilgrimage was very frowned upon and uh, even illegal. And a lot of the dedications were forcibly altered. They became St. Mary or they became some other saint, you know, all saints or whatever. But um, a lot of the St. James the Greats just disappeared. Yes. So, I have it mounted on a backer board in our family room here at the house, and people come into the house and say, well, Dale, I thought that Camino thing was in Spain that you went on. <laughs> why, why is there a map of England up here with the confraternity of St. James in the bottom and whatnot? So I explained to them that there was all this activity that people are not really aware of, that they yeah. seem, well, as, as some people today think that Camino de Santiago is the French route, and that's it. There's nothing else. There's only one. They don't know that there's other routes, there's other services, there's other places, locations where all this devotion to St. James 
has been happening over all of the years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I think uh, I mentioned in that chapter, European Pilgrims Today, uh, the incredible amount that was discovered once Eastern Europe opened up. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Because we had no idea how much there was or that there had been really much of anything. It was just terra incognita. And all of a sudden there were uh, Polish enthusiasts and mm -hmm. people from, you know, Bulgaria and the Czech Republic and Romania all yeah. saying, well, we had a pilgrimage to St. James too. And mm -hmm. we walked west until we linked up with some route and we just filtered in with all the others. But some people started way, way back, uh, you mm -hmm. know, very, very far back. So it's it's simply fascinating. Never ends. <clears throat> Oh, I met a uh, I met a pilgrim in Mastea, and he asked me where did I start. So I proudly told him that I started in Saint John. <laughs> you know, like I climbed a mountain, and I said, "Where did you start?" And he says, "Amsterdam." And I said, "No, no, I'm I'm Canadian, but you know, where did you start?" And he said, "Amsterdam." <laughs> and he showed me his three booklets of stamps that he had, like, yes, uh, amazing, yeah. <laughs> Yes. Uh, speaking of pilgrim groups, uh, Laurie, there's when Tom and I were hospitaleros in Fonse Badan. Yes. And, and you're familiar with this, the ruins of this little town that is slowly being brought back to life. Mm -hmm. And I am very. Yes. yes. We understood mm -hmm. that the roofing there was done by a pilgrim group. Uh, yes. Of students from Germany. Is that who no, not not students. Um, now, I, I, here's somebody that uh, I talk about in in uh, make reference to anyway in in uh, in Waybread, but in a different chapter. No, this was done by young people from the Christophorus Jungenwerk from uh, near the area around uh, uh, Freiburg in Breisach, and they are um, young people who have a variety of needs uh, that on the whole are going unfulfilled in society. And this organization tries to uh, get them onto the right path as in completing their education, giving them some security, uh, helping them to learn useful things for their lives and so on. But mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, this is one of the three groups that I concentrated on in the chapter on the praxis of transformation, which I think is chapter eight in Waybread, mm -hmm. along with uh, the Oikoten group in Belgium and the um, the um, Hospitalité Saint Jacques in France, the Christophorus Jugendwerk is a, a it's a social reinsertion um, program uh, with a specifically Christian um, formation outlook. Uh, whereas the Oikoten was was doing a similar thing, but without that, um, yeah. and the, it was rather interesting to contrast the two. Oikoten, of course, doesn't really exist as a separate entity now. It has been subsumed into various other Belgian um, efforts at social reinsertion. But I believe that the Christophorus Jungenwerk is still going stronger than ever. And uh, it may even have branched out into other areas of Germany, but they they came along um, on in various summers, uh, organized by again. They, you always need a link here. This was um, Don Angel uh, Fernandez de Rangis from the Palatine Fathers, who wonderful man, absolutely wonderful man, uh, a Basque uh, who had done his priestly training in Germany and spoke fluent German and mm -hmm. had in fact encountered the Camino in Germany rather than in, uh, in his own part of the world. And he uh, was very uh, helpful in engaging the interest of the Christopher and Jugendwerk and the jobs that needed to be done on the Camino. And that uh, roof that you describe in Fonte Barona, turning the, the, uh, the chapel into an albergue and the 
and the sacristy into the chapel, as it were. Yes. Um, it just, uh, you know, was was all all him and everything from finding the people to do it to then uh, going out and scrounging the furniture from various places. He was very, very um, personable. And when he got uh, enthusiastic about something quite irresistible to, you know, organizations, he would, he would have them offering all manner of things. But he really um, almost single-handedly brought into being, uh, I've forgotten whether it's seven or nine albergues on the Camino Frances with the help of young people from that German association. So mm. wonderful, wonderful effort. And oh, yeah. a lot of those kids found such purpose and pleasure in that uh, task that they went home and got themselves onto apprenticeship schemes and found, uh, you know, a living becoming a carpenter or electrician or something like that. That's the kind of thing that the organization exists to help them do. Yes, uh, that's amazing. And it's wonderful that they they can do that. When I I met in I met up with a, a youth group. Walking, I was walking by myself on the uh, Camino Portuguese, and all of a sudden there was twenty three people around me, young people, three nuns and a and a priest, and they all had their names on the backs of their T-shirts. And this was a youth group walking to Santiago for two weeks. This was part of their education religious education and it the first night i stayed in the albergue with them and they're eating pop and chips and laughing and whatnot till as young people do till 11 o'clock at night the next night i'm going to a hostel i'm not, i need some sleep i can't i can't do this anymore and they're looking for me the next day they're oh what happened to our pilgrim <laughs> they had adopted oh. me so it was really nice that they they felt that way and we fit in very well. But many nights I would go to a hostel and let them have their fun. And of course, the sisters and the priest, they weren't about to tell them all they had to go to bed early. They were they were just thrilled that the, the youth were enjoying this so much. And right yeah. in the cathedral in Santiago, I met them in, in the plaza right in front of the cathedral and we had a little party and it was it was really nice. <laughs> Well, the I didn't mention the um, the other uh, leg of that project was, of course, volunteer kids from the Diocese of Astorga who were, um, oh, you know, right. on the Spanish end. So these two groups worked together with no common language. And, and there were some very good friendships struck up, but nonetheless, uh, among them. And uh, a few, few conflicts, too, I gather, I heard about. But... Um, you know, they didn't like uh, something or somebody took too much interest in somebody else's boyfriend or whatever. But, you know, it, it on the whole was a pretty harmonious exercise and they got on well. And it was it's very educational in every human sense to to bring kids that age together, because it's amazing how much can be transmitted without a common language, really. I mean, it's a yes. lot of goodwill. So mm -hmm. um, that's pretty international. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was a good, great experience for me to see them there and be part of their their Camino. You know? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Time, I've I've yeah. certainly met uh, I've certainly met Oikaton, uh in you know when Oikaton was functioning. I've met Oikaton monitors with their you know small groups, and you often in the way they dressed and and so on, you really couldn't tell. The, the monitors from the from the um, you know the young charges, but uh, they just were they did, were just such good friends to them. It was yes. more a question of accompanying them in this life changing growth experience and adventure that was the Camino, right. and not uh, so much um, you know certainly no sense of you know being heavy handed or in loco parentis in any kind of obvious way. They just had a a lot of fun but luckily i mean those kids knew that they had to get to santiago they yes. were not going to be allowed either to goof off or to run off um, <laughs> <laughs> en route so yeah. so there you have it. never forget a girl who had a white rat as a pet um, oh. and it it ran all over her as it was almost popping out from behind her ear or something um, <laughs> and uh, nobody could separate 
her from this white rat or the white rat from her. It was quite endearing, really. Yeah. <laughs> There's, you know, th that group reminded me of, um, <clears throat> you know, the groups, and I wanted to ask you about this, was the the reasons why people go on, on pilgrimage. Well, today it's, you know, spiritual, it's religious, it's geographic, it's exercise, it's so, so many different things. But back years and years and years ago, there were some people that were deathly ill, and today I'm sure that's the case as well, <clears throat> or that they, they've committed a sin. This is the penalty, or this is what they need to do to be restored. Um, I had an experience on the Via de Plata. I started off, as I usually do lately, by myself, and I, I met an older Basque pilgrim and a younger Cadiz uh, pilgrim. And this young pilgrim, so we, we we got together and we're walking, the three of us. And in the two weeks after Zamora, we're going to stop and be a hospitalero with Tom. We meet four other pilgrims in two weeks. It was amazing. I loved it. It was so, so much solitude. But the young fella is taking pictures of road signs or signs of where we are. And he's busy texting and he's got this phone out and he's way he goes and the first day I'm thinking well he's got a girlfriend or something or a mother or father he wants to know what's going on back there because it's always taking a picture of the road sign mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, the older gentleman the Basque is looking at me and I'm looking at him and we're talking back and forth and I'm trying to catch up to his Basque language and he's speaking to me and you know got the land so I, I get lot, most of that and after three days, he asks, and this is a really nice young man. You know, you can tell when you go into a bar, he's so polite to everybody or people on the street. He's so polite to to meet and talk to. And three days later, uh, he's approached and the three of us are sitting down having a coffee in a bar. And he tells us that he is there because the court in Cadiz sent him gave him the option of 30 days on the Camino to Santiago from, from Sevilla or jail time. He would have to be spending some time in jail. The judge did not want him to go to jail. The judge wanted him to take this guidebook and walk on the Camino. And he was taking pictures of the road signs, sending it back to the courthouse in Cadiz so that mm -hmm. they would know where he is and what his progress is so that they know he's still out there walking and away he goes. Yeah. In his offense, it was a very minor, stupid thing. It was, he borrowed a friend's car and his girlfriend was involved and he was drinking and he got charged with car theft and he, he was supposed to be a borrowed car. It was really stupid, but he was a really nice young man. So the next day or two, you know, the older fellow, Jose and I are into it. We're making faces and we're getting around the around the signs and we're getting into the picture with him and having a great time for him to take pictures to send back to Cadiz. He's very quiet. I get up to Zamora and Tom is going to meet me there to be a hospitalero in Zamora. And those two guys are walking on. And I got tears in my eyes and he was so embarrassed. We all had tears in our eyes when he told us that story in yes. that bar that day. I felt so badly for him. And when they when they walked out of Zamora and I was staying to be a hospitaler, I had tears in my eyes. I wanted to be with those two guys, but that's not yeah. where I was supposed to be. Two weeks later, Tom and I take a bus up to Santiago to be at the Encuentro for for hospitaleros, the, the meeting for the yearly meeting of hospitaleros. There he is in front of the cathedral in the square. Talking and dancing and singing with other pilgrims. He's just alive. You know, it was just amazing to see the transformation of this very quiet, shy person. And he gets to Santiago. I guess he's now he's free from his court uh, information yeah. as well. But he had yeah. come so alive. So in the past, there is was there not a lot of people or some people that were sent as a penal uh, requirement to do their time on the on the Camino. Oh, oh yes, and the um, it's it's no accident that 
uh, Oiketen was established in Belgium because as you know, uh, you know, back in the, in the um, 15th, 16th centuries, the low countries were uh, pos Spanish possessions. And mm -hmm. uh, so Spanish uh, law, Spanish monarchy uh, ruled all of that. And there was a strong tradition of penal pilgrimage from the low countries. And uh, so that residual uh, memory, I think, still informs the idea of sending people. Um, you know, I'm sure more recently, I don't know anything really about the space between, but it's, uh, it's entirely logical to me that that, that um, mode of um, carrying out a, a penance would be known to, you know, very, very commonly known in Belgium, part of the culture really, it derives from that period when the the Low Countries belonged to to Spain. So um, interesting uh, that, and there were proxy pilgrimages too. You know, you mentioned oh. um, someone <laughs> someone who was ill, who might wish to uh, ingratiate himself or herself with uh, Saint James and say, "Please cure me," and or help help someone my child who was ill or something like that. Um, if it's somebody who could pay someone else to go on pilgrimage uh, on their behalf, that was also um, something that that happened. And But that could be from, from anywhere, not mm -hmm. uh, necessarily from the low countries, but penal pilgrimage has a, a venerable history from that part of the world. Yes, well. I'm always uh, amazed that when I go on a pilgrimage <clears throat> on the Camino de Santiago, I meet people and I fall into a group usually after a day or two or three or whatever that walk the same speed or have the same crazy sense of humor, whatever. And, you know, you ask, why, why have you come here? Why have you come to the Camino? And it's initially... It's all oh, because I have two weeks, I have four weeks holidays or because I'm between jobs or what a da 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 da, all kinds of reasons why. And after about day five or six or seven, you start to understand or they start to tell you what it is from within, what they're looking for on the Camino. And that to me is very special. That's mm. That's so nice. When I when I'm there, I'm I'm looking at myself. Where is my better self? When I go home to Canada, what can I change? What can I do? What what relationships can I improve on? Or you know, I'm I'm just a human being. I have character defects. What can I do to change those? I used to think I wasn't prejudiced, but one week on the Camino, I'm going, yeah, I have prejudices. You know, like I'm not. I, I'm not. I need to. There's things I need to work on. So when I come back from the Camino, then my Camino starts. It's it's my it's it's my medicine. It makes yeah. me better, you know. It does something for me, and that's so amazing to get that from other pilgrims. To finally hear why why they're there and uh, what they would like to have experienced while they're there. My my first experience here. In 2003, I didn't know anybody except Confraternity of St. James in London here. I, I met a guy two weeks before I was going, and I was amazed that he had been on the Camino. Like, this is the first pilgrim I've met, and I'm asking him all these questions, and he's not answering them. He's saying, I don't want to give you uh, information that you might have expectations when you get to the Camino. So that I don't want to tell you anymore. And I'm thinking, well, he's not very nice. You know, <laughs> he's mm. holding information from me. But he wasn't. I know what he was doing. But he did tell me something important. He said, Dale, when you get there, there's only three things you need to do. Find a place to sleep, find some food, and help other people. That's mm. it. That's all you need to, you know, today with all this digital stuff happening, going on, it's... Um, when I arrived at, in 2003, on May 23rd, there was 68 pilgrims arrived in Santiago. And I know when you arrived there, there was a lot less. Mm -hmm. Today, there's a couple thousand. I don't know how I would feel. You've 
things are changing there rapidly. How do you feel about what's happening <clears throat> to the Camino now that it's changing in those ways? Well, you know, I I, I devote a, a lot of of uh, space to that very question um, in Waybread in various essays. Really, uh, it's a it's the part of one of the threads that ties the the book together. But uh, it you know there are things that dismay me. There are things that worry me. There are things that uh, I, I get a lot of elation from. Um, mm. I mean, there's no doubt that the Camino is more accessible now, more inclusive now, mm. uh, that all kinds of possibilities are there for people who back in 1986 could not have done it at all. Um, and, you know, that can only be a, a good thing. But I do worry about um, commodification, massification, commercialization, all the Asians, you know, uh, I, I do, I do worry about that. And I worry about, um, I suppose, the, the idea that, that history gets trampled in the rush, that yeah. history is so easily marginalized and forgotten, that everybody wants a part of uh, whatever the, the, uh, the current um, mode is, and will kind of make things up to ensure that they get a bit of it as though, mm -hmm. you know, truth is always a casualty. And I, I do get concerned about things like that, but then, you know, each of us as an individual, we, we have a choice about how we do the Camino, about what we bring to it, what we, what we, you know, what we take away from it and how we live that. Yes. And you don't have to be dictated to by technology. You don't have to let technology rule your life or intrude upon it any more than you want it to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you don't want to use uh, GPS or booking.com, then don't. Uh, you know, just don't. Just don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, d just, uh, you know, it's the easiest gesture in the world. Put your hands behind your back and say no. <laughs> so just you know, yeah. um, leave the phone off. Um, everybody has a choice about. I often think this when I when I drive down to Piedrafita on a sunny morning and I see pilgrims. Alas, I, I wave to them, but they're often plugged into some earpiece mm. and they don't wave back to me because they don't hear me coming, which in my noisy little car is quite something. But mm. I realize too that they're not hearing the bird song because they're listening to you know dire straits over the earphones well come on you can do that anywhere anywhere anytime and yes. the morning walking along the beautiful road in the sunshine is not the place to be doing that yes. um, and uh, so I, I like to think that they come to realize that and stop doing it I don't know whether they do or not but um, mm. it's uh, it, the Camino is to be lived and savored every moment of it, I think, and put the extraneous stuff away uh, because that's exactly what it is really. And I, I think it's so important to talk to fel fellow pilgrims too. You know, the conversations you have with people from places that you, you never dreamed of ever meeting mm -hmm. anybody from, um, yeah. you know, you're not, it's a, they're gifts and you, you're not going to have them uh, when you're at home in an armchair, that's when you can sit and listen to whatever you want to listen to. Mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> anyway. all for that. I'm all yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I think basically um, each person just has to decide what's really important to them and simplify. Just just try and focus on the experience you're having and and live it to the full. And uh, anyway, that's. Uh, my platitude for the day but <laughs> well, I, I, I 100% there with you Laurie do, do you have a project in, in front of you of uh, future writing materials of history of the Camino there are some other item of the Camino that you're working on now um yes I am uh, I'm translating a book uh, really about Don Elias and I oh. am writing one about not so much about him as as about the extraordinary 20 years after his death uh, mm. which i lived through very 
closely. Uh, that's uh, sort of my story entwined with uh, the Caminos and I haven't written about it anywhere because um, it's, it's too close to the bone in many ways in the, in the sense that there are a lot of people still around uh, who I would have to mention by name. And um, uh, so I, I kind of held back on that, but yeah, I'm writing that and, and um, um, you know, writing and translating something all the, all the time, really. Yeah, good. good where, where I live in La Laguna is a very good place to do that. Yes, yeah, good for you. The um, the Bata Fumero in in the Pilgrim Mass in Santiago has yes. always been, captured me. That my daughters were watching this film here, National Film Board. It was a 1998 or 1994 um, seat National Film Board called Croix in French, meaning believe. Yes. And here's a silver thing flying through the air, and I'm heading out to a meeting. And I walk out the door and I'm captured by it. I'm looking at it and I say to myself, I don't know where that is, but one day I'm going to be in that room. I didn't have any idea what it was. And then I find out later it's the it's in the cathedral in Santiago. Yeah. And I've, I've been there many times and I've been fortunate enough to watch this thing swinging through the air and thinking to myself, man, if this thing lets go, there's going to be 300 of us in the hospital. <laughs> it's got a huge thing for the smoke and fire. Did you Have you come across much research or information on that history? Um, never done any. I, I think probably what I can say about it is pretty well what you can read. Uh, you know, in just about anywhere, um, I I know I know through history there have been a number of uh, botifumeras, and it's uh, it, it's it's interestingly um, the, the it, we now spell it with a B, but as you know, a B and a V in Spanish are very close, and it's uh, much more uh, botifumero. You know, uh -huh. the it, the idea of 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 um, of uh, disseminating this wonderful uh, sense, scent as uh, smoke, as a kind of emanation. And the, of course, it's a sensor. It's, a, it's for burning incense. And incense is supposed to uh, rise up to mm -hmm. uh, the heavens and uh, give glory to God. It's expensive. It's uh, ravishing. It's um, delightful most of the time um, to to those of us who experience it. It's a it's a way I think of expressing reverence and veneration, as yes. well as you know the the old adage that it was meant to um, you know kind of air the church or improve the air in the church when it was full of uh, pilgrims fresh into it, you know, off the road. There may be truth in that, and that I'm sure that was the effect, but I'm not sure it was the intention. I think the intention is a prayerful one, and that that scent is is meant to rise as prayers are meant to rise, you know, heartfelt yes. exaltation, if you like, joyful thanksgiving and as to you know whether 300 people would end up in the hospital it has come free of its moorings a couple of times you know <laughs> and uh, the legendary one is is uh, that it it um, broke free the night before the young catherine of aragon was being uh, sent to the united kingdom to england to marry uh, prince arthur the brother of uh, henry the who became Henry VIII. Um, she was first married to his elder brother, and it was taken as a terrible omen uh, that it it crashed right through the um, transept window and out into the square. Nobody <laughs> knows whether it there uh, flattened anyone, but it was, it was uh, accepted as an absolutely terrible omen and remembered in decades later when her dreadful fate under Henry VIII, um, you know, when she was locked up and then divorced by him and so on. And her mm -hmm. sad end this was prefigured in the, in the um, disaster of the Botifumero flying out of the, of the cathedral. So mm -hmm. this was what it was said to be anyhow. But uh, it's gone through various incarnations. There have been half a dozen of them. And at the moment there are two 
there's a, a silver replica uh, made in about 1970 something. And mm. uh, then there is the, the one that is used on a daily basis. So um, not daily, but frequently anyway, yes. which is older. <laughs> so it's, it's wonderful how the cathedral welcomes the pilgrim and, and honors them. Yes. And pilgrim mass, you know, really they've, they've, when, when we had the Encuentro, as an example, um, the, the one that I was at uh, with Tom 2010, they gave us the cathedral for one evening and said, you can have your Vesper service here at the cathedral. We, we honor the hospitaleros that have been part of the structure of pilgrimage and have helped support the Camino. So you can have your Vesper service here in the cathedral. It's yours. And that was very special. That evening, they were reading in rote all the hospitaleros that had served that year, where they had served. And it was a, so nice the cathedral did that. But that's recognition. Another item of recognition that uh, I've just learned, I understand, Laurie, that there's there's a recognition of you in Santiago. On a wall? Oh, you mean the mural? Oh, the mural. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> that is, uh, that's, um, well, I don't know how to describe how I feel about that. Okay. Um, it, it's, okay. uh, it, it's, um, it was a complete and utter surprise to me yes. uh, because the, uh, the, producer of the project that that resulted in that uh, is a, he, he'd been hired by Estrella Galicia, which is a, a very, very philanthropic Galician company, which mm -hmm. makes um, uh, Estrella Galicia beer, but it also does a lot of other things. And in the holy year 2022, 21 2, 21 2, they they wanted to do something for the holy year and they mm -hmm. they they he he rang me up this producer and said could we come along and uh do a program do a documentary program on your garden and this was the height of the pandemic but before there were any any vaccines around i think anyway so so i said well sure you know gardens there the door gate is open you're very welcome and they they came and um, only months later did he ring me up and tell me who the client was who was collecting these short documentaries of many, many projects of every description. And they then narrowed it down to seven that they were going to put to illustrate with these murals on walls along the Galician stretch of the Camino Frances. <laughs> and uh, and he said, and your garden is one of the seven. Wow. So there have been about several hundred different ones. So I was very, um, well, I don't know. Uh, I, of course, I was touched. I was pleased. I was quite humbled, really. I thought, honestly, here am I, a, a foreigner. And so many people do so many wonderful things. And he said, well, we're going to put you in Tria Castella. So I I joked and said, please don't put me in Pedrafita. I'll lose every <laughs> friend I've made if everybody's faced with a an effigy of me, you know, and every time I go down to do their shopping, there I am on a, the side of a building. I thought I couldn't think of anything worse. But uh, in the end, I didn't end up in Tria Castella. They, for reasons known only to themselves, they put me at the as the last one on the way into Santiago. Maybe I was the international person, I don't know. But yeah. there I am, you know, yes, on the on the side of the Hotel Oca del, del Puerto del Camino and mm -hmm. uh, holding a copy of A Hug for the Apostle. So, yes, it is quite a quite a surprise to see it every time. That's wonderful. That really is. That's, you know, honoring so much you've done as well for the Camino. That's really special. Good for you. <laughs> well, thank you. I didn't thank mean to spring that on you, but I, I was very curious. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, someday, not on a recorded broadcast, I'll tell you a wonderful story associated with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, uh... okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 
that pretty much wraps it up for for this interview, Laurie. Thank you so much. You've been very You're generous, very, very generous with your time and your information, and we we appreciate that very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and for some very intelligent questions and a nice opportunity to talk about uh, things that really are very dear to my heart. So, yeah. thank you. Thanks are mine. <laughs> yeah. Been very pleasant. Let me thank add. You. Let me add my thanks. That was a wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed being the fly on the wall, hearing it all. So, oh, he was on. Oh, I didn't know he was. I, there. I was here. <laughs> <laughs> Are oh, we anyway? Anyway, anyway th thanks very much. We'll 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 wrap this up and uh, we'll get this thing uh, posted on the CCOP uh, YouTube channel and uh, people have a chance to share it. Okay. So well. I'm just gonna... All right. Go ahead. Look forward to seeing you one day, Laurie, and hearing that little story about the rest of the story. The well, if you if 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 Tom can turn the recording off, um, you know, I can tell it to you right away. It's just uh, okay. <laughs> you got it. I don't know whether, I don't all, know whether... all 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 the people listening are going to be incredibly curious. Uh, but <laughs> I I will repeat I will repeat the story for a slight fee. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs>